You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul Dillon and Dan O'Neill. Hello and welcome to The Big Album Show. I'm Dan. And I'm Paul. The four of us are a band hailing from Newry, County Down. They released their first album, Songs for the Tempted, on CBS Records in 1989 with the single Mary becoming one of the most played songs ever on Irish radio. The album went double platinum in Ireland and won Best Album of the Year at the Irish Music Awards. It's consistently on people's lists of Irish albums you must hear, and it's certainly on ours. Um, Today, we are absolutely thrilled to have Brendan Murphy on the show. How's it going, Brendan? Great to be here, you know. Glad to be asked. It's always good to see that, uh, you know, particularly, you know, your older records are still sort of resonating with people, you know. Brendan, it is a, it is a, it's great to have you, and we're, we're delighted uh, to be chatting to you on the big album show and remembering this great album. Um, before we get into the hot takes and the discussion on the album itself, one thing that strikes me about the four of us is that sort of three decades on from, say, Songs for the Tempted, the four of us are still going strong, stronger than ever, big fan base, loads of shows, loads of set out shows coming up. And I'm wondering what the secret is to the longevity. Um, Is it the fact that not just the quality of the music and the quality of the tunes, but is it the commitment to the live shows all over the the place that builds you up that audience that has just stuck with you for so long? Um, You know, I would, I, I, uh, I think that it's, it's been, no, I mean, I think that we've tested our audience's patience um, uh, uh, many, many times over the years. I I think it's bloody mindedness and patience that uh, have kept us in the game, (laughs) you know, because really, I mean, there's been, there've been horrendous, there's been gaps between albums um, in our career uh, that uh, would have killed um, normal uh, bands. I don't know how it didn't manage to, so like in some cases up to 10 years, like more than once. Um, and uh, so I, I think that, you know, I, I actually think that what it is, is that we always knew that, and particularly because we didn't make it easy for ourselves because we had gaps between albums, that when we came back with an album, um, uh, it really had to be, we really thought it's going to have to really be great. Uh, we'd have to think it was great, like really great. And uh, or we, or it just, it wouldn't, you know, it it, uh, it wouldn't be worth all the effort. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, these days it's different because um, you can't go away really. So, uh, you know, I mean, well, you know, and, and technology is, has been, has sort of helped us, you know. And also I'm at an age now that um, I can't afford another 10 years uh, between albums. But I think that... Uh, what really what it is to boil it down is basically that we always knew that the songs had to be great. They had to be great on the record and they had to be great life. And, um, and if they're not, you're just wasting your own time and you're wasting everybody else as well. And, you know, I think that that, that has kept us. And also I think that, that our records, we have, as we've got older, we haven't tried to make records for the generations that are younger than us. We've always tried to, to, to sort of grow up with our audience. So as they've got older and we've got older, your concerns and your interests change and, and that's reflected in our record. So I think that we've, it's a conversation we've had with our audience that has sort of lasted through, at this point, over 30 years. What strikes me, Brendan, about it is that the, the four of us seem to be entirely lacking in cynicism, uh, if you don't mind me saying, because I've come across the band, a number of festivals, uh, different types of events, um, and the four of us arrive and bring this passion as if it's almost the first gig, you know, and it's definitely not the first gig. But I've been at some shows in the middle of the day and, you know, other other acts, a little jaded maybe, I'm not too happy to be here maybe, and on come the four of us like straight straight out like it's like the, it's like their first time on the stage and I, I mean i mean that in a really positive way i think that's what that's what's when i see the four of us on the bill somewhere i go how good the four of us i got i'm definitely going to catch them well that's great to hear i mean that is really great to hear because we 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 love it and i can honestly say and i i, I can't and that's that one of the things that has surprised me the most about um uh 
the music business is that I love it more now than I did when I started. You know, I mean, and I certainly love playing live uh, more now. I mean, I'm better at it. Declan's better at it. Um, and uh, it's it really is. I, I know how lucky we are uh, to be on, on that stage. And I know how lucky we are to have people um, who are willing to uh, pay to see us. I know it. So when we when we turn up, and, and I also know that particularly, you know, that maybe the babysitter's booked and they're, you know, they're not 17 or 16 anymore, you know, which they were when we started. So there are lots of other competing interests. So I'm really grateful for it. And, you know, our shows are, are two hours plus now. You know, and uh, really, we have to be dragged off the stage because we just—it really is. It's, 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 it's so much fun. It really is. Uh, one of one of the things that struck me when listening to uh, this album was that it it appears to me anyway that you put a, a great deal of thought into the kind of track listing and the order the tracks come in and. Like I noticed, for instance, and maybe, maybe, I, I, maybe this is just complete coincidence, but for instance, if you look at Mary and then you look at how uh, One Strong Hammer comes after it, um, although the textures and kind of um, rhythm and so on is very different, in the verses of One Strong Hammer, you have the same chord progression effectively, and it's also in the same key. So... You know, for the listener, it, 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 it flows very well together. And there's kind of a subtle, very subtle similarity between the two songs, but it creates a really interesting flow. Did much thought go into the, uh, the structure or am I reading too far into it? No, well, certainly a lot of, a lot of thought goes into the wrong order. I mean, uh, album wrong orders have always been like sort of the big thing for us because we're big fans of, of albums and we're big fans of wrong orders. And, uh, and we know how a, a bad running order can sort of, like can really, uh, uh, it <laughs> can play havoc with an album because a lot of people don't have the patience to get to track four if you haven't closed them in the first three tracks, you know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, and again, I suppose as well, uh, what you're saying, there's also an element of, if you, if you play a song like, um, a song like Mary, which is, um, uh, you probably, which at that period in our career, we would have thought was a bit slow. I mean, there's nothing slow about it, like, but we would have seen it as a, you know, we, we saw that as one of the, like, one of the songs that was, didn't have as much on it as some of the other tracks. And then we wanted to, to sort of build it up, uh, ramp, uh, ramp it up again then uh, after that track. Although we certainly knew that, um, we, I think we placed, I'm trying to remember the wrong order, is it? I'm trying to think, is it third on the album or? It's inside one anyway, but yeah. um, I think it might be third. Well, uh, track three um, is uh, normally a pretty important track for us on, on, on an album, you know? Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's really well put together. And, you know, your comments about great songs making people return um, is, is completely true because the great songs on this album certainly make me and Paul return to it again and again. You said of Mary and um, the song, um, which is just a classic. It's 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 now a folk song, I think, in in Irish yeah. culture. I, people yeah. sing it at parties, wakes, weddings, whatever. It's it's a fantastic song. You said of it that when you're playing it live, you don't actually have to sing it because people um sing along and 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 actually sing it back to you. Mm -hmm. Tell me this: who was in in the words of Smokey, I suppose, uh, or or to paraphrase Smokey, Mary, Mary, who the hell is Mary? Yeah, well, she was, you know, she was a, she was a girl um, that uh, 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 that I was uh, crazy about. It was the first time I really had a, a sort of adolescent crush, and I was about uh, fifteen um, at the time. And um, I thought that she'd notice me, um, but she didn't. And um, and then um, I remember one time a car stopped, and um, I was not, you know, I was in two ways at the time. This, it was a Ford Capri and the guy kissed her and he had a beard. I found out he was a DJ. And um, and it took a while to get over it. I mean, you know, I knew I was screwed because he was he was older than she was and she was older than I was. Like a 15-year-old had no chance for a 17-year-old. She started working in the bank and um, uh, I never really had a chance to, um, to talk to her or tell her how I feel. So I poured all my bitterness into a song and made the boyfriend this sort of like, 
bad egg. And basically we're saying like, why, why, why choose him? Why not choose? Why not choose me? And uh, as a, you know, as I said, I didn't get the girl, but hey, I didn't do too badly out of it. Did Mary ever find out the song was written about her? Uh, funny enough, we did a show in Newry Town Hall. Uh, I'm from Newry, and this whole story happens um, happened in Newry. And uh, we did a, a 25th anniversary show on in Newry Town Hall. And um, I was looking for her. I shouted out, she's there, you know. But um, if she was, she didn't say anything. And I, so I've never, I haven't seen her in, um, I haven't seen her since I went to college. So that was, uh, you know, that was, I went to Queen's, Queen's University in 1980. So I haven't seen her since 1980. So the song was sort of, was written way before the songs that attempted. In fact, it was the first song I ever wrote. It's credited from, as, yeah. as, a, as a band written song, but it was the first song I ever wrote. Yeah. I, I couldn't really play the guitar. I couldn't really play the guitar. I'd been trying to learn, so I basically just had a couple of accords and, um, and uh, I, uh, I, play, I uh, it, but it's funny, you know, isn't it, isn't it odd that, uh, that uh, you, I wouldn't rhyme Frank, with bank now, I probably would. But that's just too obvious. But you know, that's you know, that's that's uh, maybe that's why it appealed to a load of fifteen-year-olds or sixteen-year-olds towards the average age of our audience. Whenever um, so whenever that song uh, was released as a single, at that point, I was you know in my twenties. It's it's such a wonderful track, Brendan, and it's a track that. The whole world knows. Uh, I mean, and the way it the way it starts, it it's like something warming up, and then it just builds, and mm. then it just it's like a, it's like a sunburst or a sun rising in the morning, and off it goes. And um, but for me, it's the, the album um, is pure escapism, right? It's for me. I feel like I should start dancing side to side. It brings me back to the to the music of the films of the period in the late eighties, early nineties. And um, but for me, not just this album, Songs of Attempted, but all of the four before us music is a kind of escapism. I loved uh, Change, the single, which was ninety eight or ninety nine. Brendan, it would have been. And um, yeah. loved Heaven on Earth, but my favorite four of us album, which was two thousand and three. But for me, there's escapism in the four of us music. It brings you somewhere. You know, it's like the, the lyrics and change. It's late, but not too late. You should know better than that. There's a storytelling element of it as well. Yeah. It brings you somewhere. And yeah. Is, is, is that when, when you were doing songs for the Tented, were you, were you conscious of bringing the audience on a journey and bringing them to a destination? Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, the only destination we wanted to take people was the destination we wanted to go to, which was outside of Northern Ireland. I mean, we, we had grown up, in the in the during the troubles and um you know i was listening to at the time albums by like grace jones nightclub and a roxy music or you know and it all seemed like exotic um and sort of uh this sort of other world like i'm one strong hammer i'm talking about america i've never been to america you know eh, but it was it was uh you know it, it was it was when I put on headphones, like myself and Declan would both say that basically music was a, an escape for us from the troubles. We could just put the headphones on and we were taken out of what was a pretty grim um, situation, really, you know, looking back on it, you know, um, uh, it was, uh, I mean, the family were great and you, you, they did the best they could in the circumstance, but it was rough. It was a rough, it was rough. There's no getting around it. And um, certainly, you know, it, movies and music was your escape, you know, and it was the same way like a, a James Bond movie or something. I just wanted to get, get me out of here. And I remember thinking, imagine if you could do that, if you could do that to other. But you, but you did it, though. You did it, Brendan, though, didn't you? I mean, it, that, and there's nothing it, 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 it that, that's what I've never discussed. We've never talked about this before. We've never met before this evening, but that's exactly, that's exactly my feeling as the person right. listening to the record that I'm going somewhere and that I'm escaping from something. And suddenly, and I just wondered, you know, when the album was released, um, it was five years before the IRA ceasefire, nine years before the Good Friday Agreement. And um, I wonder what it was like releasing an album in Northern Ireland like that in 1989 
and what was touring like and you know what was the atmosphere like i mean because obviously the record is escapism but can you kind of escape for want of a better word the kind of reality that you see around you yeah you, you i mean the reality was it took us out of it it took us out of it i mean i went to university at queen's university which is in belfast which was still you know you couldn't go to the city center the city center was blocked off um uh it was it was barricades at the top and the bottom of, of the main uh drag and the, the city center so really the, the college life was really confined to you know just around where the college was and um uh so even when i was at college uh, you were still uh in the middle of it but we signed our record deal with uh, when i was still studying law at university um uh with CBS Records, now Sony, in London. And, uh, and, that, and the second, once that happened, then we, you know, that we ended up sort of on, you know, I mean, it really, you were suddenly, you were staying in London, you were recording in London, you were, uh, you know, you're sitting in, in conferences with like George Michael over there and, you know, I mean, it was just surreal, you know, really. Um, and uh, and we they start we started touring um, the UK a lot, and because CBS Records had a um, had an office in Dublin, uh, not in Northern Ireland, you know, as far as Northern Ireland was concerned, the UK was part of the UK, so the London office took, took care of that. But the Irish office of CBS was actually very very powerful, you know. Um, uh, and uh, so suddenly they were able to really um, uh, help us um, bring make people aware of us in Ireland. And we had a manager at the time who was also very clued into the Irish circuit. And suddenly we found ourselves um, on the Irish circuit. That's really where we sort of learnt. And, you know, and we weren't, you know, the record was a we had we had the record has an unusual it wasn't like any record that was around at the time which is part of the reason for its success particularly in Ireland because in Ireland really the the model was the sort of U2 model which is a four piece rock garage band who you know essentially are a live act that go in and make a record whereas we'd gone into a garage and were so depressed with the sound that we made that we basically bought a, a four track porta studio and and played everything into that um and then the rec the, the record then sort of grew out of that and then when we were, even when we were making so like we cbs records never saw us play a gig we had never played a gig when that album was being made I mean, we we busked in uh, France uh, acoustically and stuff like that. Uh, three brothers had, but we didn't have a drummer. I mean, all the all the it was basically that that old album was written on acoustic guitar. I mean, the irony is it was written on acoustic guitar and um, a Casio keyboard that um, uh, that my mum had given to my dad when he retired, and he just wasn't interested in. But it had a it's one of those keyboards back then that they have a range of sounds, like they have a sort of a bossa nova sound and they have a timpani sound. And, you know, and we were literally playing. So if you listen to songs attempted, first single, Just Can't Get Enough, that's the bossa nova rhythm of the Casio. Um, that has been named, we made it bigger sound. One strong hammer, again, exactly the same rhythm used for that. And as far as Mary's concerned, I was playing an acoustic guitar and with the, I had the timpani, Play, pressing the tippity button going bump, ba bump, bump, ba bump. I'm thinking, well, that's just going to be, we use that to keep time, we'll have a proper drum kit or whatever on it. But, and then everybody went, oh man, I love that. What is, what's that drum sound that you've got going on there? <laughs> you know, going, that's dad's tippity sound on this Casio keyboard. And they said, oh, we've got to use that. We'll just get a better tippity sound and we'll, we'll make the record around that. So that's why Mary, for example, has that weird, rhythm that's it's not like a drummer it's 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 just this that has that bump the bump with, with the timpani sound in because it was really taken from uh, the casio so it was a very odd record um because it came from that format and then when we went to start playing it live 
it was a challenge. Let's put it that way. It may, that, it's, that's an incredible insight into it because I was going to mention the different sounds on the album and, you know, the timpani sound, as you say, and it's definitely not, you know, a garage band album. No. It's, um, it's, it, the sound is so, so big. But now that you mentioned the Casio sound, I can almost, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the songs and I can see the influence there. That's a brilliant insight. Um, one of the things we do, and it, uh, this, this is difficult for a lot of artists we have on the show, is we ask people to pick their three top songs off the album we're talking about. Now, I, I know on different days you might have different uh, answers, but today, what would be your three top songs? Um, my three top songs would be, if number one would be Washington Down, which was, uh, you know, which was recorded really, really, really fast. Like, I mean, it was done in three takes. I mean, uh, for which was for us, considering how long some of the other songs took, um, but that was, it was just a very simple acoustic song, but it, uh, it is sort of stood up well. And we did it in front of 10,000 people, with 20,000 people over two nights at Fela Classical in Central Stadium with an orchestra behind us. And the version on that record actually is phenomenal with the, with the string arrangement, the, uh, the uh, Irish Chamber Orchestra backing us on that song. Um, but uh, that, that would be number one. Number two would be Mary because, I mean, hey, uh, you know, it's it, you know, and the thing about Mary, part of, it's there's a couple of reasons that it hasn't faded, uh, but the one reason is the story song. I mean, it actually has a story. Um, so, and uh, it's just, uh, it's just, it's it's uh, it's, and the other thing is, it's very hard to do this, which is basically it doesn't change chords. It's hard to write a song that the that the chords don't change, but the melody changes so completely that you're a hundred percent sure that uh, it, it has gone somewhere when it's gone nowhere. I mean, essentially the, the, the I guess I said, I can play the guitar really. So I knew three chords, so I certainly couldn't move anywhere. So I, I had to make a, make it write a different melody line to signify the change from the chorus to the verse. And as far as, you know, you, you, we, we still find ourselves having to do that a lot of times. And, um, for various reasons, but I've, it's, I've never done it as successfully from a mel from a mel melody point of view as I did in that song in terms of like uh, the verse and the chorus. That'd be the reason for that. And then the third one is a song that I just think I think it's the best. I think it's a great song, but I'm not particularly uh, crazy about the version that ended up on the record. Um, we did it. We did a version for Dave Fanning. Um, uh, I think that was produced by. Pat at McCarthy, who went on to um, produce, um, he produced uh, Counting Crows, um, August and Everything After, and he produced uh, a few REM albums, an Irish guy, very talented uh, producer, as well as working with you two. And um, that version of the song, I think, was, 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 was better. The song's called Lightning Paul. I love the story of the song. I love the lyric of the song. Um, and I think I just think it's a, it's a really great song, and it had to be produced slightly differently. I think it would have been a single, um, but it, it, it's just one of those songs that um, you know, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure it reached its full potential uh, on the album. Um, some some songs did and exceeded them, but but not that one. I'm struck by the image of you um, playing at Fela Classical and having 20,000 people in front of you and having an orchestra behind you. When you're about to walk on stage and you know you have this orchestra behind you and all these people in front of you, you know, how do you feel? Do you, get, do you still get anxious or nervous? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, particularly, particularly on... Um, on, uh, on on, on a song like Mary, uh, you know, uh, in fact, there's two, there's two I, I can tell you two quick stories about what it's like to play Mary with an orchestra. And uh, um, the first one is um, uh, Fela Classical, which was, um, uh, we were rehearsing for that show. We only had, we only had uh, two, we only had, I think, um, two hours, two or three hours to rehearse with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. You know, and then it was basically shoot. It was a shoot show day. That's because they were uh, just the amount of money that it cost to get all those people in the room. 
And, um, and they're all reading music. And I turned, I was talking to the, the guy that was running the show. And when we arrived in, it was like stunning walked out. We arrived in and uh, the guy goes, okay, we're going to run through the three songs there. And then they, we ran through Mary. And I've been doing Mary for 30 years, so I know how it works. And, I, and at, the, at the end of the first run through, I said, we've got a big problem here. And they said, well, what's the problem? I said, you've ended the song. The audience isn't going to let that happen. You realize that, don't you? I mean, you're going to end the song and they're going to keep singing. And um, I said, is there any way? And I said, and I'm used to every, you know, we're used to, we're used to that happening. So is there any way that um, you can just cycle the last four by? So the chords don't change in the bloody song. So it's not like it's rocket science. You know, you just, uh, so they tried it. And um, I said, well, when do we stop? And I said, we'll stop when the audience start, looks like it's, I said, I'll signal something to you when I feel it, you know? But on the night, of course, I completely got carried away. <laughs> um, I swear to God, when, uh, you know, we were, because the whole thing was recorded for, for the live, for an album, the Feel a Classical album. So I let the audience sing it and we sang along and then the audience sang it and whatever. And then about two months later, I got a phone call from the guys that were putting together the album. And they said, uh, OK, we've got some good news and some bad news. And what's the good news? The good news is um, the, the tracks that we've got for the, for the album turned out fantastic. Obviously, we want to use uh, Mary, which, which sounds great. I said, oh, that's good. He said, uh, I said, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is that it lasts for, for nine and a half minutes. And uh, <laughs> we've, we've, you know, we've got to narrow it down to like three and a half minutes. So then we, they had to do a sort of an editing job. But they did include a bit of the audience singing work. But then we did another show in, on, where it was with, the, this time with, in the north, with the Ulster Orchestra in the waterfront um, hall in Belfast for St. Patrick's Day. And we were, we were performing Mary. And in that situation, we had rehearsals as well. And, and basically, I don't know if you know who Noel Eccles is. He's, the, he's a, a really great, great uh, drummer, percussion player. With, he was Moving Hearts percussion uh, player, does a, does a lot of stuff. And, but he works, at, he was working with the Ulster Orchestra anyway. And um, the, the tribes are rehearsals and we could, just couldn't get it they kept losing time with us because i should add that when we did the feel a classical one we had we had our drummer peter mckinney and we had a bass player uh, john mccallis our bass player but when we did um you know the four of us at this point was really me and declan so when we did the, the one in belfast in the waterfront it was me and declan in the orchestra so we didn't have a drummer so we found it really hard and they couldn't keep in time with us and we and uh we knew it was bad when the guy that was, it was all being televised for St. Paddy's Day. We knew it was bad when the guy, Mac Edgar, who was the head of the whole thing, came over and he said, you know, you don't have to do Mary. But we knew that they had learned the arrangement. So we thought it must sound God awful if he's saying that you don't have to do it. <laughs> so so we, we had a bit of a power. And what we figured out the problem was, was that the guy that was playing the timpanis, who was Noel Eccles, the timpani is traditionally at the back of if you if, if you're watching orchestra and you see where the timpani is played, it's normally at the very back row. It's never at the front of the orchestra, which is might be fine for the orchestra, but isn't too good if you're trying to, to keep a rhythm. You know, and he was playing the 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 the, the, the Casio timpani sound on real <laughs> timpani. So we said, what if we move Noel right up to the front, and we basically just all we hear is him and you guys behind. No, I haven't said that. It's, You've got an orchestra behind you, 75 people. You, you're hearing more than him. But I said, at least we could hear him. And um, if, you, if you check YouTube, um, the four of us, uh, Mary, um, at the Waterfront Hall, you can see um, us and, uh, as I said, Noel Eccles, a fantastic percussion player, basically joins the band. They moved him right beside us. And he basically did the, you know, the uh, daddy's uh, timpani thing on the... Uh, you know, and uh, it, 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 it worked, but um, yeah, that song, we've, we've, we've played it now a few times with the orchestra, and, but it's a phenomenal, I mean, it's, but the stakes are high, if you, if you mess it up, like in the one case, if we had messed it up, we'd have messed it up in front of 20,000 people in our football stadium, yeah. um, and, and the other one, we were, been, we were messing it up in front of a God knows how many millions watching, especially televised St. Patrick's Day BBC programme, which was, so it was even, even, the stakes were even higher and it was live. So, uh, 
it's a bit hard. I mean, you don't want to think about it too much, really, you know? We've all been at that gig, Brendan, haven't we, where something just goes wrong and they say, can we start again, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Brendan, some of the comments that came in when we were uh, saying that we were going to do this show with you about Songs for the Tempted, um, lots of people talking about these Thursday night Facebooks that went on during the lockdown and great positivity that was on show and connection with the audience and a bit of joy and a bit of positivity, all good and red wine recommendations, which I, yeah. which I've told are very good. Um, and yes. a, a lot of people as well saying really about your family and um, got a you know, lovely message from John up in Newry, just about your dad, who was a great supporter of the band, uh, but sadly passed away last year. So your family, he was very have been very supportive of your efforts down through the years, Brendan. I'm told. Yeah, I mean, you know, my dad. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, dad and mom. Yeah, I th- really think that um, when I when I was, you know, I, when I was I went to school with a lot of guys that um, I think they just wanted to get out of um, they they. They wanted to get out of, uh, um, you know, a sort of a working class situation, and they wanted a, a nice, comfortable, secure life during, uh, you know, growing up in a period that was very volatile. Um, and uh, I think there was a lot of people I grew up with that wanted security and wanted. You know, like a lot of my friends ended up in, in uh, lawyers because they wanted some control. They wanted, they wanted control back in a state that, uh, they, where they didn't feel a lot of control. And, and uh, uh, I think that that was, you know, whereas the gift that my mom and dad gave me, my dad and mom were, I, you know, Find a way to. My dad was self-employed, so immediately, and he was a what's called a bookie, a turf accountant, which is relatively risky, really. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a, so basically, you know, he had a small office. He wasn't like Paddy Power, you know. He, so he, he had a small office, but you know, if you get a, you, you bad couple of months, you could technically be put out of business if uh, you know, and. Uh, I I think that that gave me a, t- a taste of like oh well that's you need to be going for something where there's a big upside. I remember thinking that you know you need to be going for a big upside you know and uh, that that sort of a gamble thing didn't really and it was a gamble um, really and uh, I, I also think that I didn't have uh, I I sort of thought that he he, he they both made it us feel really secure. That's all I can say. Really secure. Secure enough to think that maybe you could make a leap. And it would have, it, it was a leap. A leap from uh, to being, you know, uh, in a, in a band. I haven't said that. I think that really he thought it was a hobby that we we're going to grow out of when we started doing it, you know. But I remember when the contract came through from CBS Records and he looked at it and his eyes watered up a bit in a sort of like a, you know, <laughs> not in an emotional way, more in like a, you know, I th- actually think he thought that we'd managed to hoodwink a major corporation into, into <laughs> you know, that was not really what he admired. He didn't really think we had the talent to justify the deal. What he thought was, they're going to be all right because they haven't managed to hoodwink a major corporation into giving them a record deal when they haven't even done a gig. Like what sort of buck agents would do that? <laughs> you know, what sort of major corporation would sign a band that they've never seen perform live? And you know what? In retrospect, hit a good point. <laughs> Brendan, it's been an absolute pleasure and a great joy to have you on the show. Um, we, we, we really, really have enjoyed it, haven't we, Dan? It's been, it's been just a pleasure to have you. 
Yeah, really, really good. You know, I was uh, telling Brendan beforehand h- how much the band men- means to us. And I was telling him, I was telling you, Brendan, that, uh, you know, Mary was the first song I learned on guitar. And 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 I, I think that's a story. Uh, a lot of people have a very similar story. So um, you're, ju- you're just part of kind of popular culture on our island. And I just think it's fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Thanks well, so thanks so much for inviting us, you know, and, you know, it's great that uh, that uh, Songs of Tempted has been included on on, uh, on a list uh, for the big album show. So uh, yeah. we're, we're thrilled. Get that album on if you're having if you're not familiar with Songs of Tempted, get it on and get dancing because it's a dancing kind of album. That's the feel of it. It's quite remarkable. And it'll bring you back to the period as well. And um, Songs of Tempted, great album, great record. And Brendan, thanks very much for joining us on the big album show. You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul and Dan. Please remember to subscribe, hit like, and remember to follow us on our social media platforms at The Big Album Show.